Hi there, Smart Drivers talking to you tonight about social driving, the very reason that causes traffic crashes. <laughs> because many people, many drivers fall victim to the myth, I have the right of way. <laughs> and it is a myth because you don't necessarily have the right of way to be a safer, smarter driver. So tonight we're talking about social driving, driving as a social activity and the reasons for social driving, the reason that people are mean and what you can do about it, what skills and abilities you can put in place to, to keep yourself safe and to re significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. Oh, apologies. Yes. I still don't like how they changed <laughs> the functions on my software. It's still not intuitive. Here we go. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver during the 1990s, uh, hauling freight between Ontario, Canada and the lower 48 uh, in the United States there. Uh, while I was going to university in Australia, I drove buses for Grand and one of the regional bus lines there. Uh, I became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. So it's crazy to think that I've been a driving instructor for uh, almost a quarter of a century now. And most of my driving instruction has been with semi-trucks, buses, uh, air brakes, log books, those types of things. Uh, 2006, I graduated with my doctorate in legal history from the, uh, from the University of Melbourne in Australia. Uh, with my, I had a specialty in legal history, which is the study of policing, courts, and prisons, as many of you may know. And my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. I started the YouTube channel in 2015, uh, built a business around that. It's been wildly more successful than I could have imagined. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we turned over 300,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel. And uh, I was looking at the left-hand turn video here. Uh, it was one of the first videos that I shot. And then I redid that video because there was some questions about that I wanted to answer from smart drivers and realized that the retake of the left-hand turn video I did five years ago. So it needs to do to be done yet again <laughs> to help out for sure. So I've been doing this for a while now. All right, uh, new video short last week. Uh, definitely have a look at these uh, winter stopping tips and you can find the links to these down in the description below the live stream here. And as well, disobey these signs and you'll fail your driver's test. These signs are regulatory signs. So speed signs, uh, do not enter signs, yield signs. These are all regulatory signs. And if you have an action that is contrary to these signs, you will not be successful on your driver's test. So i.e. speeding or you enter a do not enter street that has a do, clear do not enter sign on it, you will not be successful on your driver's test. All right, uh, social driving is one of the things that unites us as a human race, regardless of creed, religion, race, politics, beliefs, culture, everyone on the roadway will agree with the statement, I am a good driver. <laughs> Few drivers would say that I am not a good driver, I need some skills. Now, I have learned that there are in fact some people that would say they're not a good driver because they're terrified of driving and there is a large, not a large percentage, but there is a percentage of drivers that are afraid of driving for whatever reason. Uh, they experienced a crash, uh, they weren't trained properly, they've uh, had the fear of the fear of God, so to speak, quote unquote, uh, put in them and they're afraid of having a traffic crash when they're driving. But most drivers, the majority of drivers would agree with the statement, I am a good driver. All right, drivers are reactionary. They follow too close. They stop too close in traffic and they stop too close to other road users. And I have this happen when I am walking, drivers will go past me and they are way closer than three feet, one meter. And it makes me incredibly uncomfortable when uh, drivers in their cars crowd me as a pedestrian. And keep in mind that vulnerable road users, pedestrians, motorcycle riders, cyclists, you are most likely as a driver to encounter them at intersections. People and drivers and road users are seem to be ignorant of this fact. And if there's nothing else that I achieve uh, with the Smart Drive Test uh, YouTube channel and the business is to educate drivers 
that they need to be more aware of what's going on at intersections. More than 40% of crashes happen at intersections. As you're coming to an intersection, you need to identify the intersection, you need to map and locate road users, and you need to track them to be a safer, smarter driver. All right, one of the reasons that we do not communicate effectively as drivers and road users is because of nose to tail. Okay, the front end of your car is pointed to the back end of the car in front of you. Think of it like standing in a grocery store lineup. You are not talking to the person in front of them because you're looking at their backside. That is not conducive to good communication. And this is the communication that we have and are forced to deal with in traffic every day. One of the things that I suggest is, is that we put radios communicators like cell phones in our cars that we can talk to people within a 200 foot radius of our vehicle. I think that would really change uh, the way that traffic operates on our roadways. We could say, hey, you know, I'm making a left turn turn. You're kind of crowding my lane a little bit. You in the red car there, could you move over to the right a little bit? You know, maybe it might work. Maybe it might not work. Maybe it might just be another uh, 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 way that we can bully other drivers on the roadway. But right now, our communication on the roadways is not effective, okay? When traffic clo uh, slows, vehicles are even closer together. The spaces between them closes up. And unfortunately, as we talked about uh, in the introduction with uh, clusters and lines in the wintertime when it's snow and icy, is that one driver breaks, every driver breaks, and by the time you get to the back, up, uh, the back of the lineup, with 10 or 15 cars, the last car is actually coming to a stop and it's called a phantom traffic jam. All right, too close in queues, uh, people stop too close, uh, you get rear-ended and the number one crash in North America, number one reported crash is rear-end crashes, more so than windshield damage. So this is the unverifiable, or the verifiable fact rather, that drivers are following too close and they cannot get their vehicle stopped. And as I said, in the wintertime, this is even more important that you have more space in front of your vehicle to get your vehicle stopped. Bilateral control, this is the big scientific word that they use about space in front and space behind. Because if you have space in front and space behind, you are a safer, smarter driver, all right? The other piece about this, is that if everybody did this and managed space in front of their vehicle and behind their vehicle, we would have less congestion on our roadways, but we cannot convince the uneducated of this. They believe that if they're going to get through traffic faster and get to their destination at an earlier time, they have to be closer to the car in front of them and they have to push their way through intersections which the very opposite, in fact, is true. If we had more space, we could drive faster and we could move more cars through an intersection. But you will not convince people of that because there are too many people in the traffic safety arena that do not have education and the required facts and uh, skills that they need to be safer, smarter drivers. All right, communication, drivers fail to communicate. And the number of people who say to me that other people cut them off, they didn't signal, this happens all the time. It's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when it is going to happen. Unpredictable actions are erratic and without warning often, but if you are paying attention to traffic and you are reading the telltale signs of what other road users are doing, you can often uh, figure out what other drivers are doing, what other road users are doing. For example, if they're gonna change lanes, they're hugging the left side of their lane if they're going to move left into the left-hand lane before they even start signaling. They're going to start moving over first and they're going to be crowding that. Speed relative to intersections. If they start slowing down before an intersection and they're moving to the right, there's a high probability that they're going to turn right at that intersection. Even if the other driver doesn't signal, you can still figure out that in fact they are going to turn at that intersection. The other piece about it is as if you're in the left-hand lane and you're managing space because there's a car in front of you and you can't pass whatever vehicle is in the right-hand lane and the car comes up on the inside. If you've got a bit of a gap there, you can be guaranteed that that person on the inside is going to move over in front of you on, in the left lane. They're gonna take that space. So communication, there are many ways that you can interpret what other traffic is doing. Drivers 
in the arena of social driving are reactionary and retaliatory. As I said, they're following too close and hoping on a wing and a prayer, they're gonna get their vehicle stopped. And if you do something wrong, they are going to tell you in no uncertain terms by honking their horn or telling you number one, banging on the steering wheel, those types of things. In the arena of social driver uh, driving, other drivers and road users will police your actions. <laughs> if you do something wrong, if you're speeding, uh, if you're going too slow on the roadways, uh, if you make a left-hand turn against a, a sign that says left turns prohibited, they'll bang on the steering wheel, they'll honk, they'll tell you, number one, they will tell you and criticize you for doing something wrong on the roadways. All right, right of way, the right, I have the right of way myth. This is the number one cause of traffic crashes, that in conjunction with uh failing to give way, following too close, and speeding. But speeding is complicated because it has several definitions, not just one definition, which is driving above the posted speed limit. So right of way, failing to give way, and I'm right, you're wrong, okay? Just because I'm doing something while I'm driving, it doesn't mean that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> do what I say, do what I say, not what I do, right? And there are lots of drivers out there who do not have a high skill level when they're driving. So they're convinced that they're right in what they're doing, even if they're using a cell phone while they're driving. It's it's not dangerous because they see it as a victimless crime. Nobody got hurt. Oftentimes many traffic infractions are seen as tax fraud. They're seen like tax fraud, not as tax fraud, but they're seen like tra tax fraud. It's a victim victimless crime. Nobody got hurt. So therefore, it's okay that I do it. It's a technical offense. And this belief within the realm of driving is not new. This has been around for more than 100 years since the inception of the motor car. So know that uh, when you're driving. All right, so good luck on your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Driving, for those of you who've been around for a while on the Smart Drive Test uh, website and been part of the Smarter Driver community, you know that I talk about driving as a social activity and crashes happen because it, two or more people <laughs> are involved, right? It's not monocausal. I mean, there are many, many single vehicle crashes out there, but there's always a reason for them happening. But most crashes that go to litigation uh, end up in court in front of the lawyers and those types of things is because one person got injured, somebody made a mistake, or somebody did not implement the skills and abilities of defensive driving, smarter defensive driving. Rawson, it is going well. Hello, my friend. Colton is, hello, hello. And uh, anybody I missed, uh, Mallory, I missed my friend Mallory from the Maritimes there. Uh, Mallory always gets here early. So hello, Mallory. And uh, yes, we're also going to talk about winter driving, which ties into social driving, because one of the components of social driving that ties into winter driving, <laughs> as soon as it does what it is right he right now, where it's minus uh, seven degrees Celsius, it's about 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, somebody could confirm that for me. I think it's about 18 degrees Fahrenheit uh, here where I live. And it started to snow. And when it gets snowy on the roadways, what happens with all the drivers is they kind of line up in a line and they go down the roadway together. <laughs> if you're driving in the wintertime, stay out of that line. I'm not sure what it is or what the mentality is with drivers that they think they have to drive like NASCAR drivers, especially in the wintertime, and they all have to go the same speed. Not really sure what that is, but if you can get out of that lineup, of cars going down the roadway at the same speed in the wintertime, you are going to be far safer. Because if something happens with one car, it's going to happen to all the cars. <laughs> it's like freeway pileups, right? First, first and foremost, most of the time it happens in foggy or blizzard conditions. There's a whiteout you can't see and drivers are following too close for the conditions of the roadway. It's not about speed. Okay, it is to some extent, but not the same extent as it is about space. If you have lots of space, you can get stopped. And just on that note of smarter defensive driving, uh, freeway pileups, if you come down the freeway and you see a pileup, you see the cars bashing into one another, but you are able to get your vehicle stopped, stop back from the cars, lots of space, get your four ways on, and then start moving forward very slowly. The reason you want to move forward very slowly is statistics driving instruction has shown 
that moving cars are less likely to get rear-ended. Okay, so you don't want to move fast, but you want to move slow enough that you're not gaining on the crash in front of you. And also you've got your four ways on and you're watching what's coming up behind you so that you're not part of the pileup on the roadway. Okay, that's how you uh, protect yourself and implement defensive strategies that are going to keep you safe in the event of a pileup in the wintertime. All right. Uh, Marion, I drove for the first time last Thursday in snow. It was so cool. I didn't go far, but it was cool to be in the snow. <laughs> yes, it is. And you live to tell about it, Marion. That is awesome. Really, really great, my friend. I just, it's, it's really great, Marion, to see your evolution as a driver because you started here when you got your license, you took your driver's test and uh, you've been here and been part of the Smarter Driver community and now you're driving in snow. All really awesome, my friend. All really awesome. Okay, uh, Stabby, uh, oh, that is what you refer to as social driving. I've seen people here in New Brunswick do this even when the roads are good. I change lanes to free lanes and space up. Yes, and Carrie's fr here from Minnesota as well. Yes, social driving, driving in a line, driving in clusters. However, what I'm talking about with winter driving is that it becomes more accentuated in the winter time. When you see 15, 20, 25 vehicles all in a line driving at the same speed and it's snowing. Uh, in the summertime, when roads are clear, they will still do that. They will still drive in clusters and you want to stay out of those clusters. You want to stay in those out of those lineups. It's more important in the wintertime because conditions are slippery and you're not going to have the same braking, the same space. So you definitely want to stay out of those lineups. Marion, uh, yes, I did. Thank you, Rick. I felt quite proud, actually, and you should, my friend. That is really, really awesome. Uh, elevator head drivers cut me off today and almost crashed into me. And yes, any time it's a close call and you can learn from that, that is really great. Uh, so Moa uh, from Ghana, watching you live. Keep up the good work. Thank you, my friend, for your kind words and welcome to the Smarter Driver community. That is really awesome. And... Yes, so we're getting snow here. Uh, it's above minus 10 for the first time in a week or so here. It has been brutally cold, uh, minus 21 degrees Celsius, which is about minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. It has been cold. <laughs> yes, and I'm sure that much of uh, northern Canada, the prairies, western the United States, and all the same have been experiencing the same because I know that it's cold almost everywhere because uh, how to start your vehicle in cold weather uh, has peaked <laughs> the, the number of views of people watching that trying to get their vehicle started uh, in cold weather has really gone uh, kind of crazy lots of people are watching that video so hopefully it's helping people out to get their vehicle started in the winter time and in super cold weather so when it is cold sub-zero temperatures and you want to get your vehicle started uh, if you have a push button start keep your foot off the brake pedal because as you know you have to put your foot on the brake pedal for the vehicle to start keep your foot off the brake pedal and then push the start button let everything light up on the dash. Uh, the gauges go up and those types of things. Uh, wait a moment and then uh, put your foot on the brake pedal and then start the vehicle. And you only want to let it run long enough to clean the snow and ice off the car because it doesn't need to sit there and idle for 10 or 15 minutes. I know that we have some namby-pamby drivers and they like their creature comforts, they like their heat, and they think that they're doing the car all kinds of good by letting it sit there and idle when in fact you're not. It's harder on the vehicle sitting there and idle. idling. Just take off as soon as you get the snow and ice off it and drive it moderately. What I mean is drive it easy, okay? Don't drive it hard because everything's still um, cold and <laughs> frozen. It's kind of like you going outside. Uh, same, same thing with your car, right? The other piece about it is people say, well, you need to heat up the engine and you need, everything needs to be at operating temperature. When the vehicle is sitting there idling, the only thing that is heating up is the engine. You are not heating up the transmission. You're not heating up the axles, the oil in the axles, the drivetrain, all the moving parts in the drivetrain and those types of things. So only until you drive the vehicle do you heat up all of those other components. It's really hard on your engine in the wintertime to let it sit there and idle. Now, I know that there are exceptions to that if you get out on the prairies and you're in those sub-zero temperatures where it's minus 40 degrees fahrenheit minus 40 degrees celsius then yes it needs to sit and idle for five six seven minutes before you take off now the other piece if it does get down to those minus 40 degree temperatures 
Fahrenheit and Celsius, you may want to get a bit of cardboard and put it down in front of your radiator to just stop some of that cold coming through the radiator to try and generate some heat out of your vehicle. Now we talked about with this with Corey a few weeks back, things that might be wrong if your vehicle is not generating heat, okay? First, it might be the thermostat in your vehicle. They get stuck open. So what happens is, is that you have a cooling system in your vehicle and it heats up and keeps the temperature of the engine at uh, optimum operating temperature, okay? Usually it's 170 degrees Fahrenheit, 180 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever that might be. Until the engine reaches that temperature, the thermostat will keep it a closed system. It will not open and will not let fluid in the cooling system circulate. If the thermostat is gone in your vehicle, it's inexpensive. It'll cost you less than a couple hundred bucks to get it fixed if you take it into a shop. And then what happens is, is that will stay closed until the engine heats up and then you'll get heat in your vehicle. Now, the next step to that, uh, if you're not getting heat out of your vehicle is, unfortunately, and this one is a much more expensive fix, is the... Um, uh, the the uh, the heater core in the vehicle, okay, and the heater core will run you into fifteen hundred bucks, two thousand bucks in your vehicle if it's not working. The heater core is the part of the vehicle where the cooling fluid is plumbed into the cabin of your of your vehicle, and it's like a heat exchanger, right? It exchanges heat into the cabin of your vehicle, and, and sometimes that can be gone, but that's going to be a, a, a mechanic. Most of the time, it's going to be your thermostat. So if it takes a long time, it takes 20, 30 minutes of driving before you start getting heat out of your vehicle, it's probably going to be the thermostat on your car. Now, like I said, if it's minus 40 Fahrenheit and Celsius, they're the same at minus 40, uh, then you might want to get some cardboard uh, or Bristol board or whatnot and put it down in front of the radiator so you're not getting that cold air forced through the engine and it, it'll help to warm it up and those types of things. All right. Uh, Ross and all-wheel drive can have great advantages on driving in snow and ice. Uh, Ross and it can, but again, it doesn't matter what kind of vehicle you have when you're accelerating, all-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, front-wheel drive. <laughs> the trick is always getting the vehicle stopped, okay? Because there is no braking system that is going to give you an advantage of getting your vehicle stopped on slippery conditions on snow and ice, right? So this is why most people end up in the ditch, not because they're going too fast or accelerating, it's because they get into trouble going around curves, corners and turns, and they get into trouble when they're trying to get the vehicle stopped. And they brake too hard, or they're going too fast, and they, they're going too fast for the conditions of the roadway, they brake too hard, the vehicle goes out of line, and they end up in the ditch, okay? So that's what happens. So it doesn't matter what drivetrain you have, yes, you're gonna get your vehicle going faster, they all have the same brakes and you have to get them stopped safely in the winter time. My friend Tim is here from Drive Smart BC. Hello, my friend. Uh, if you are in the province of British Columbia, check out Tim's channel, check out his website, uh, not his channel, but check out his website. Great forum over there. Lots of information for your in traffic safety, uh, issues of maintenance, policing, case law, and uh, as well, a great forum over there with experts that you can participate in conversation, engage in conversation with them. Definitely check out Drive Smart BC and check out my friend Tim over there. Uh, Savvy, I saw a Ford F-150 2023 sliding here in New Brunswick on a downhill. And yes, you will do that. Uh, that happens. Uh, car theft for vehicles who have pushed to start. I opted for a key ignition push to start or stolen more apparently according to STV Insider. Okay, I did not know that. Uh, obviously, they're able to get around the security systems in the vehicles and those types of things. Marion, uh, last couple of mornings when I have started the car, it doesn't like starting, but I hear a faint beeping as well. Should I get it checked? Uh, Marion, do you have any check engine lights or anything like that on? Any warning lights on in your car? Because uh, if you don't, then, you know, probably not. Uh, Tim, same thing with four-wheel drive. You can go, but they all have to stop the same. Yes, they do, my friend. <laughs> Getting them stopped, that is your issue on slippery conditions. It doesn't matter whether it's snow and ice, whether it's rain, uh, in the fall with leaves on the road and those types of things, uh, freezing rain and whatnot, you have to get them stopped. And then, you know, the question I put up on the community tab yesterday was about what is the best practice for stopping your vehicle in the wintertime? The best practice for stopping in the wintertime is slowing down and stopping, almost stopping back from where you want to stop and then creeping up to where you want to stop. It's the same thing in a big truck. 
okay? So if any of you go for a CDL license or driving a bus, it's the same thing. You slow down back from where you actually want to stop, and then you creep up to the, to the light, to the traffic light or the stop sign or whatnot. Uh, same principle. Uh, thanks, trouble with the whole site upgrade. Some pages are not indexed properly with Google, but they still are all there. Oh, you're going through that too, are you, Tim? <laughs> I'm going through that too. I'm moving all my uh, websites over to new servers and whatnot. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. So I, I feel you, my friend. I feel you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Colton, uh, do you live near Bloomington? Okay. Uh, Mallory, it is winter out here in the Maritimes too. Today we started out with snow and then changed over to rain. Uh, yeah, we are definitely, I can see outside, we're definitely getting snow now, but it is above minus 10 degrees, which is nice. Uh, Ross, and if your turn signal fails you, hand signals, but drivers won't see hand signals in the dark. Uh, no, they won't. Uh, if your vehicle is, if the lights aren't working on your vehicle and you're driving at night, it's best to get to your destination or get to some place safe if you can do that. Uh, and that way you're going to be safer. <laughs> Tim says, hooray for Drupal 10. Yes. Awesome. I'm not familiar with that, Tim, but I um, am definitely familiar with the challenges of having a website. That's for sure. Tim says, we're all better than the average driver. Absolutely. Otherwise, we wouldn't be out driving around for sure. Uh, Julia, indeed, I'm a bit nervous when driving. Yes, so there are some people, as I was saying, not everybody is comfortable with driving. Some people are nervous. Some people have some anxiety and trepidation around driving. And that's okay, right? It's what keeps us sharp. Uh, even with all of my driving experience, when I'm out driving, I am not 100% comfortable. I'm about 98% comfortable because, as I've said before, I love drivers. I love road users. I love teaching driving. But... I don't trust other drivers and I've seen the severity of crashes. I've seen what happens because I do crash analysis, investigation and those types of things. Uh, it's the, the consequences of being involved in a car crash are, can be devastating, can be devastating. All right. Uh, citizen police and dry zipper merging when everyone else has moved over early. All right, uh, Rob, hello, my friend. How are you? Uh, good slideshow, Rick. Thanks so much. Thank you, my friend, and welcome here from Sudbury. How cold is it in Sudbury, my friend? All right, son, my teacher would always put your videos. He'd call you Dr. Rick. Awesome. Thank you, my friend, for letting us know that uh, you're watching some of my videos. Really great. Uh, Emily, thank you, Emily, for that uh, endorsement of the channel here. That's great. Uh, raise your hand. I have a road test tomorrow. I hate driving uh, in shoes. Oh my God, any tidbits? <laughs> I hate driving in shoes. Um, interesting. So you've been driving around in bare feet? Is It's obviously not wintertime where you are if you're, if you're not you're wearing shoes in the wintertime. Or would you prefer wearing boots? Is that your thing for driving? Uh, <clears throat> Tim says, I fear drivers that cut corners when I'm a pedestrian walking on the inside of the curve. I live in a rural area, no sidewalks. Uh, Tim, I have had that done to me a couple of times where I'm at an intersection in the residential area here where I live and the driver comes around making a left-hand turn and I have had to jump into the snowbank. The one time that I did it, I was it was the winter time and they just like right, cut the corner right off. And I was just... I was flabbergasted. I was like, oh my God. And this is why we have, this is why we have trust issues, right? <laughs> Especially when we're pedestrians, as you said, driving in a rural area. I don't know what it is. They feel that they don't need to square that corner off. They just like cut the corner right off. Uh, it's very dangerous for pedestrians. Uh, elevator fan. I had a left lane squatter in uh, Lafayette, Indiana today. Uh, elevator fan. They're not they're not indigenous to Lafayette, Indiana, my friend. They are left lane squatters. They are everywhere. Uh, Rom says it's okay. It's minus 11, nice and warm. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how that happens, isn't it, Rob? Uh, it warmed up here today. I think it was minus 8 this afternoon when I walked down to get the kids from school. And it, I was like, oh, it's really nice and balmy out. It's, it's very warm uh, compared to minus 25 degrees Celsius, you know, which is about uh, minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, when it's when it's sub zero, it is very cold. Oh, it's just it just zaps the energy out of you. It's so cold. Uh, Colton, okay, Stabby, I'm afraid of rear ending, so I always leave a bit of space in front of me uh, at red lights. So when a vehicle is approaching from behind, I move forward slowly. Yes, and Stabby, that is your 
defensive posturing that you want to put in place and keep in place to keep yourself safe when you're driving. Having that space in front of your vehicle, that is going to keep you safe uh, when you're driving. I just cannot <clears throat> stress, and, and actually not stress, but it is the fundamental component of the smarter defensive driving model, having that space in front of your vehicle, because we live in a society where we talk about, you know, the space cushion, the 360 degrees around our vehicle, but there's so much traffic now, so much, uh, so many vehicles on the roadway that we cannot keep space around three sides of our vehicle. But if we can keep that space in front, you're going to be a safer, smarter driver, and you're always going to have options when you're driving because space buys you time, time buys you options, options prevent crashes when you're driving, all right? Uh, Rob says it's minus 39 in Iowa. Yes, and that's minus 39 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's the same as minus 39 degrees Fahrenheit. It is cold, yes. Uh, Tim says minus eight and one centimeter of snow in Vancouver Island is shut down until it all melts. <laughs> and Tim, that's really what they should do. I mean, I lived there for five years and I mean, Vancouver Island only gets snow once a year, every couple of years. Uh, do we really need to go to work that badly that we're risking everybody's, uh, you know, risking people's safety? It's the same thing with Vancouver and people talked about this. Uh, there was an article the other day, I think it was on Twitter, there was a post about this. People talking about driving in Vancouver and that people can't drive and they've got summer tires and those types of things. The, the point is Vancouver Island, Seattle, Vancouver uh, here in Canada, they only get snow once every couple of years in the winter time and it, doesn't, it only lasts for one, maybe two days. The point about this the snow in Vancouver, on Vancouver Island, in the city of Vancouver, and in Seattle and other places is much more treacherous than it is in Iowa when it's minus 39 degrees Fahrenheit. It's much more treacherous than it is here in the Okanagan Valley when it's minus 10 degrees Celsius. The reason is, is because it's wet snow. It's at the freezing point. And there is a layer of water on top of that snow and ice that lubricates it and makes it slippery. Think of an ice hockey rink when the Zamboni goes out and, and uh, um, cleans the ice. When a Zamboni goes out and cleans the ice, it drops a layer of water on top of the ice. That's when it is most slippery because it's the water that lubricates the snow and ice. And it is the same thing when you get snow on roadways when it is at freezing, 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. The reason is, is because it's lubricated on the top and it is much more slippery than when it's minus 10 degrees Celsius or minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Because it's frozen, think of um, another way to think about it is take ice cubes out of the freezer, put them on the counter. When you first take them out, they're sticky because they're still frozen solid. If you put them on the counter and leave them there for a minute or two, then they get really slippery and they're they're off across the countertop because they've melted and now there's a layer of water on top of it. This is the same thing that happens when you get snow and ice and it's around zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really, really slippery. <laughs> I can remember driving on Vancouver Island when they got snow and I had, uh, you know, another Honda, S, uh, C, uh, Honda CRV like the buggy you know, great in snow, but even with that, it was still touch and go driving on that snow and ice because it was so slippery. Uh, Rob, uh, you are so right. I'd rather drive in minus 40 than minus seven. And yes, because even now we walked and on the roadways this afternoon and it was minus eight degrees and it was start, everything was slick. Okay. Because all the ice had been there and frozen the cars have been driving over it. They've been polishing it, polishing it, polishing it. And now it warms up to the point where salt will melt the ice, right? Because salt will only melt ice down to about minus eight. After that, it won't melt anymore. And what happens is they just throw sand on it and other material to try and get friction on the snow and ice. But it was starting to get slippery because the temperature is going up and now you're getting that layer of water on top of the snow and ice. And that's why it's slippery. Uh, Colton says it's minus 10 degrees Celsius in Arkansas right now. I'm sure that is pretty cold, Colton, for, for Arkansas. I'm sure they're not used to that uh, kind of cold weather. 
Corey, uh, it's been super chilly the past few days uh, with the wind in Winterpeg. Uh, yes, um, how cold, Corey, has it been here in Winterpeg? In Winnipeg, Manitoba. It is known for being really cold. Uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, both super cold in the wintertime. It's like Duluth, Minnesota. It is super cold there. <laughs> you know, the Dakotas, Iowa, those places just brutally cold in the wintertime and of course you know the upers the upper peninsula in michigan those places just wow and you know the maritimes can get it down uh in the wintertime as well too uh emily i've noticed lately i have a ton of drivers not signaling at all just cutting in front of uh with zero indication yeah that's unfortunate emily that other drivers do that but they you know they do it and i as i was saying in the presentation there's indicators of the actions that other drivers are going to take. Their speed is going to slow down. They're going to be crowding one side of the lane or the other. When their speed slows down in relation to an intersection or to a turn, for example, they're coming up to the subway, for example, and they want to turn into the parking lot at the subway. They're, they're, when they get to the subway, their speed is going to be slowing down and they're going to be moving their vehicle to the right. If you pay attention to those indicators those physical signs when you're driving you're going to be able to see and predict what other road users are doing on the roadway but those are advanced skills that come with experience when you're driving that are going to help you out and keep you safe because you're going to uh, predict what other drivers are doing you're going to be interpreting uh, traffic patterns and those types of things and interpreting and predicting the actions of individual road users which is going to make you a safer, smarter driver because you're going to maintain that space in front of your vehicle in relationship to changing speeds on the roadway. The other piece about all of this is to understand the speeds of different road user groups. Now, not many of us, but some of us are going to be dealing with snowmobiles now with winter time and snow and those types of things. So you're gonna to have to deal with that different road user on the roadways, but Cyclists and pedestrians know that they're going to be traveling. Most pedestrians are going to be walking at five or six miles per hour. Cyclists are not going to be doing much more than 20 miles per hour for the most part. I mean, obviously, there's some racing cyclists and those types of things, but they're rare, right? Most of us on bicycles are going to be doing 20 miles an hour when we're cycling. If you can keep that kind of at the forefront when you're driving and you encounter these other road users, you're going to know that there's going to be a speed differential of 10 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour when you encounter a cyclist and you're going to have to adjust accordingly. And being able to recognize and the relative speeds between your vehicle and other road users on the roadway, that too is going to put you at a much more advanced level of driving uh, on the roadways and keep you safer. Uh, Corey was saying that... Uh, Feels like temperature reached minus 30, almost minus 40. Yeah, that's minus 30, minus degrees, 40. Minus degrees, uh, minus 40 degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit. There, this that's the same temperature. It's just brutally cold. For me personally, my personal feeling is, is once it gets past minus 16 degrees Celsius, which I think is about uh, five degrees Fahrenheit, once it gets down below those temperatures, it's just cold. It's just brutally cold at that point. <laughs> I can take cold. But brutal cold, anything after minus 15 is just super cold in my world. Uh, Dusty, I took my uh, my time driving on the snow. Yes, and keep that space in front of your vehicle. That's really going to help you as well. Uh, Colton, I love snow, but I have that. It has to be this cold for snow to exist. <laughs> yes, there is a point where it, uh, snow does need to exist. You can get it down anywhere below zero, but, uh, you know, it's... I think for me, the other challenging part of wintertime is not that it's brutally cold, but also, you know, uh, next week it's supposed to be up above freezing. It's going to be like four degrees Celsius here, which is, you know, uh, 36 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just going to be too weird for me. <laughs> so, uh, Mary and I'm doing that. I read the traffic and recognize that someone is going to be turning up ahead. So I slack off a bit. Yes. And you just get off the throttle. And if you can control that space in front of your vehicle, just using the accelerator, Again, that's going to make you a much more advanced driver because now you're maintaining that space in front of your vehicle. If you are on the brakes all the time, you're using the brakes to control that space in front of your vehicle, you are too close to the vehicles in front. So just use that throttle all the time as much as you can 
off and on and it's also easier on you uh, less fatigue it's easier on your vehicle you're going to maintain your vehicle and it's not going to need as much maintenance and those types of things you're using the brakes less and you're just a more advanced driver all around and everybody wins when that happens uh rob gotta be prepared for those sledders out here know where the trails cross the roadways just like animals uh mooses in particular <laughs> Uh, Marion, yes, it's going to be a heat wave. And yes, got to be prepared. And uh, we have lots of those here in British Columbia where I live. And, uh, you know, sleds, snowmobiles are much different out here um, <laughs> because they're driving in the mountains and they're driving on what's called champagne powder snow, which is like large, fluffy snow. And you tend to sink down and whatnot. And it's uh, snow that you can't walk on. You, you need to have snowshoes and whatnot. So the Snowmobiles are very different out here and you see them on the pickup trucks and they're into the mountains in the backcountry and places like that where they're snowmobiling. And also, <clears throat> for those of you who do snowmobile, you know, you're going to have to have some awareness and information and some training about avalanches uh, because unfortunately, once every couple of years out here, some snowmobilers die because they get into the backcountry in the mountains and there's an avalanche and they get killed and whatnot. So that happens too. So, you know, if you are snowmobiling, you're here on the channel welcome to the channel and uh, you know get some information get yourself well informed so that you stay alive and stay safe when you're snowmobiling uh, elevator fan if you run a red light you will be at fault for a crash if someone hits you and yes that is true and if you hit someone else so we do encourage you to stay aware stay cognizant of what's going on when you're driving know when the lights are going to change uh, and there are several indicators that will give you the information that the light is going to turn from green to yellow first and foremost if you didn't see it turn green you need to be on or yeah if you didn't see the light turn green you need to be on alert that it potentially could change to yellow at any time uh, also if there aren't any pedestrians in the crosswalk it's a stale green uh, if the traffic is backed up on the cross street uh, that is another indicator that potentially the light could turn yellow the countdown timer those are the best right we all like the countdown timers, but they're not fitted on all intersections, right? Other intersections are going to have the hand that's flashing to tell you that it could potentially turn to yellow. But there are indicators that potentially it could turn to yellow. And if you think that it's going to turn to yellow, you want to be covering the brake and being prepared to stop at the intersection. The other piece about that is your situational awareness. You want to be looking in the rear view mirror to see who's behind you because you don't want people parking in your trunk rear-ending you uh, because you came to a stop at the intersection and somebody was too close and rear-ended you at the intersection so know that as well uh rob says he loves countdown timers it's definitely a lot easier when you're teaching students to drive <laughs> uh, with countdown timers for sure uh marion and please stay in the safe area and not go out of bounds yes that too uh, when you're snowmobiling in the wintertime in the mountains here in British Columbia and uh, Washington State, Oregon, Iowa, those places where they have mountains and they have a lot of snow and you're snowmobiling and those types of things. Yes, keep yourself safe. Lone Wolf, I have been great, my friend. And how have you been? Uh, Mallory, it's eight degrees outside here. So the Maritimes is still very balmy compared to Western Canada where <laughs> we are in the deep freeze and uh Western United States, uh, Minnesota, Iowa, the Dakotas, Wisconsin, Michigan, all of those places. It has been super cold, super duper cold. <laughs> yes. Uh, Bricks Wheels covering the brake. Thank you for that, Corey. Put up that video for you. Have a look at that. Uh, Carrie, in slippery winter conditions at a yellow light is the point of no return where you have to go through the intersection further out so you do not skid trying to stop for the light to turn quickly. Uh, Carrie, in the winter time, you're going to be traveling slower on roadways if there is snow and ice and there is ice at the intersection. So it's probably going to be the same skills and abilities when you're coming up to the light owing to the fact that that you are going slower at the intersection. But yes, you're gonna have to make that decision when you're approaching the intersection. Okay, do I risk locking up on the brakes here or do I need to go through the intersection? Now, there are safety features in place at intersections, all right? If you come up to the intersection and the light and you're halfway through the intersection and the light turns red, one of the red light runner safety features they have in place is, is that 
most intersections, and this wasn't so in Manitoba a few years ago, a lot of years ago, two decades ago now, because <laughs> uh, two decades ago, they didn't have this buffer of space. So most traffic lights, when, so you're going this way and the light turns red. From the time that this one turns let red to this one turns to the cross traffic turns green, there's a two second delay. The reason for that buffer of, sp of time is to reduce crashes in the intersection for people still going through the intersection. So now there's a two second delay. The reason for that two second delay is to reduce crashes due to red light runners. The other piece about this, the other safety feature about of all of this is of course now we have red light cameras, right? And this unfortunately causes people to be locking up at intersections as well because they don't want to get a red light ticket going through the intersection. Because uh, if the light turns red and you're across that crosswalk, uh, and I've seen images of people who have red light tickets at red light cameras at intersections. If your vehicle is across that crosswalk, the front end is across, you're gonna get a red light ticket, okay? And so you should, because the light was already yellow and you were charging the light. So that's unfortunate. And it's not likely that you're going to be able to fight a red light ticket because they, they have cameras and they take pictures and they know which vehicle it is and they know where the position was that you were in the intersection when the light turned red. Colin, my friend, uh, mobile gaming. Uh, how do I prevent an accident with a red light runner while going through on a green? I almost got into a really bad crash. Uh, Colin, you need to scan the intersection in advance and ensure that people are stopped, okay? Because uh, if, or there aren't any vehicles at the cross traffic, right? When you're coming up to the intersection, where you're going to get hit is you're going to hit hit on the left side, right? Because that's where the red light runners are going to come from first. So that's where you need to be looking. As you're approaching the intersection, you're looking to the left. So it's left, center, right, and then left again as you're approaching the intersection. And that is going to significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a, a red light runner crash at an intersection. All right, because... As I tell people and I ask students all the time, what, is a, what does a green light mean? And they will respond almost every time. I have the right, it means go. No, it means go if the way is clear. That's what a green light means. It means go if the way is clear. It doesn't mean that you have the right of way. So left, center, right, Left again, that's how you scan an intersection. That's how you reduce your chances of being struck by a red light runner at an intersection. Uh, Emily, how do you suggest dealing with cars that tailgate you when you're going the speed limit on a one-way road and won't stop tailgating? Okay, so Emily, if other cars are tailgating you when you're on a one-lane road, if there is a place to get off the road safely, get off and just let them pass. Now, the other piece is, is just keep that space in front of you because now you're driving for you and the person, the goofy person behind you that's tailgating you. The other piece about this is that when drivers are tailgating you, sometimes they're trying to communicate to you that you need to speed up because you're going too slow and you're being a goofball according to them. And this is one of the ways that they communicate with you that you, in fact, are going too slow. And that's unfortunate, and that's why they tailgate. <laughs> but as we know, we should not tailgate other vehicles because rear end crashes are the number one crashes in North America. So we should not tailgate other vehicles, okay? Maintain that space in front, Emily, and then that way you can drive for yourself and you can drive for the goofy person in front of you and you don't have to make aggressive movements. You don't have to make aggressive braking and that way, you know, risk that person rear ending you. Uh, retired, I try not to drive long distances during the winter, less stressful. Yes, uh, I, on the other hand, retired, will drive long distances in the winter time. <laughs> I have uh, almost every winter now, I have driven two or three times back and forth to Calgary, which is six hours away. I do not find winter driving stressful, probably because of my skill level. And, you know, it just takes more time in the winter time. Uh, I did come back from Calgary in the dark because I dropped Tracy and her mom off at the airport at 4 a.m. 
And in the wintertime, it doesn't get light until 8 a.m. So there's four hours. So I drove between Revelstoke, British Columbia, here in Canada, to Golden, or the other way, Golden, going west towards Revelstoke. And at night, it is dark on those roadways. And there is very little overhead lighting. And the roadways are covered in snow and sand and salt and all kinds of other mush and mud. And you can't see anything. And I will tell you that it was challenging uh, coming back in the dark for sure. So if you can avoid driving in the dark in the winter time, it's going to be easier for sure. There are some roadways uh, through the mountains in the winter time that are challenging to say the least. Uh, and it can just take all of your skills and it can be tiring for sure driving in the winter time when it's like that. Uh, Mary, and even when you were doing the speed limit, why must you speed up over the speed limit, which isn't safe, is it? Uh, nobody's nobody's encouraging you to drive over the speed limit, Mary. And if you are comfortable driving the speed limit, then definitely drive the speed limit. Uh, but, you know, traffic flow, as we know, is always higher than the posted speed limit, except when it's snowing on the roadways. When the roadways are bad and it's snowing and there's snow and ice, I can guarantee you that all of the traffic is going slower than the posted speed limit. Not only are they going slower than the posted speed limit, they're also in a big line of like 20, 30 cars. <laughs> Stay out of that big line. Uh, Colton Chicken Tax is a good nickname for government meddling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bolsey, uh, investing in a dash cam is the best thing you do for tailgaters in the case that an accident does happen. It is, but Bolsey, as I said, and I have said this before with dash cams, just be careful. Dash cams are a double-edged sword because we are not perfect. None of us are. <laughs> I run a dash cam in my car all the time because of the channel. and I try and catch stuff on the, the dash cam and whatnot. If you do something goofy, uh, that dash cam could potentially be entered into evidence. So know that. Uh, that if you have a dash cam in your vehicle, it can be used against you too. So just be wary when you have a dash cam because we do things, we make mistakes too. And this is one of the pieces that I want to reinforce about defensive driving. Defensive driving puts in place habits and skills that keep us safe when other people make mistakes and when we make mistakes, because we make mistakes too, because we drive when we're emotional, we drive when we're tired, we drive when we're thinking about something else and those types of things. So know that we're going to make mistakes when we're driving and the dash cam will catch all of that. Uh, you know, your mistakes as well as other people's mistakes. So don't think that if you're gonna get a dash cam, it's like, aha, I got you. <laughs> it might be, the authorities looking at you going, aha, I got you. Okay, so know that the that dash cam is sometimes, it's a double-edged sword and sometimes it'll work against you. So it's not gonna be the, the panacea that you think it is. It's not going to be the fix for everything. All right. Uh, elevator fan, is it, the, is it illegal to charge the light? Uh, elevator fan, this discussion, this debate has been raging for a long time and I suspect it will continue to rage is charging the yellow light uh, and as I say from a defensive posturing point of view yellow is the beginning of a red it is not the end of a green so you should be slowing down you should be getting prepared to come to a stop on a yellow light if you're like right at the intersection and you're one vehicle length back from the line and the light turns yellow then yes proceed through the intersection but otherwise you want to be thinking about getting your vehicle stopped to keep yourself safe and have in place the best defensive posturing that's going to protect you and other road users on the roadway because that's what we're doing as safer, smarter drivers. We're not just keeping ourselves safe and our families, we're keeping other people on the roadway safe as well. Uh, Carrie, do you think a dash cam is a good idea or not for most drivers? Uh, Carrie, I do not think that a dash cam is a good idea for most drivers, okay? As I said, we all make mistakes. And if the dash cam catches it and something happens, it can be put into evidence by police and authorities and it can be used against you. No, don't have a dash cam. And I believe uh, somewhere here on the internet, I saw this a little while ago, that there was actually a lawyer who was recommending that you do not have a dash cam in your car. Olsi, could you kindly elaborate on how the dash cams may be used against you? Is it 
live for the police to see or something in that. No, uh, Bolsey, they'll, they'll take the SD card of it and they'll look at the video on, on the dash cam and they will enter it into evidence. And if you made a mistake, you as the driver, that can be used against you as a driver. So it's a double-edged sword. <laughs> yes, as Tim says, driving is, is sharing, not a contest. Yes, social driving. We all need to get along. It's not the Olympics, right? It's not NASCAR. <laughs> We're all trying to get along. Uh, Rob, thank God for yellow lights. Uh, could you imagine the chaos of lights went from green to red? Uh, Rob, I don't even want to contemplate that situation for sure. <laughs> Uh, Colton, if I'm doing the posted speed limit, someone comes flying up on me uh, doing what I think is over and then they slow down and tailgate me. I'm finding a place to get their plate number. Okay. All right. All right. Yes. So social driving. We're talking about social driving tonight and the hallmarks of social driving. Following too close. Stopping too close in queues at, lo at uh, traffic lights. What not. Okay. And we know that that is dangerous, that we need to maintain that space in front of our vehicle because the reason for that is rear end crashes are the number one reported crash in North America. So it becomes imperative and it becomes part of your smarter defensive driving to keep that space in front of your vehicle to prevent rear ending other vehicles. Space buys you time, time buys you options options reduce the chances of being involved in a crash keep the space in front of your vehicle that is the one place that you can control space all the time so have that space in front of your vehicle have that three to four second following distance when you're stopping in traffic one vehicle length back from the uh, vehicle in front of you your landmark for that is to be able to see the tires making clear contact with the pavement or the road surface that's your landmark if you can do that you're going to be a safer, smarter driver. You're not going to rear end the vehicle in front of you. If you're sitting at a traffic light and you have that one space in front of you and you're looking in your center mirror, you're monitoring because you're the first person there and there's no cars behind you, we're watching the cars coming up behind us. And if they're coming up too fast, we can just move ahead enough. And oftentimes we can tap the brake pedal and, and flash the brake lights and that will get them to stop. All of that is a safer defensive posturing that is going to keep you safe when you're driving. Finally, space in front. If we all did it, the majority of drivers, then we could significantly reduce congestion in our cities. The problem is, is that we cannot convince most people to do this. Too many people don't have the information that they need to know that more space reduces congestion. The the fact is that most people think that they need to be tied up against the car in front of us. They need to push through intersections and those types of things. The unfortunate part about all of this is that it significantly increases congestion in our cities. But I live in a utopia and that is never going to be <laughs> happen on our roadways. Uh, Rob says, I had to turn over my dash cam footage to the police last year for evidence against the driver stalking and filming my minor students. He got charged big time. Yes and they can seize that dash cam footage on your vehicle if something happens or there's an emergency or as uh, Rob was saying that something illegal was going on. So know that, that a dash cam is going to be a double-edged sword. It's not just going to be, aha, I got you. <laughs> it could be used against you, so know that. Okay. Okay, excellent. All right. Chances are good that a search warrant would be required to seize evidence from your dash cam. Okay, and I'm sure that if they uh, authorities believe that there is something on your dash cam, then they could. It would. I don't think it would be too hard for them to be able to get a search warrant to be able to get that. All right. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. We're going to leave it there for tonight. Uh, if you had a driver's test in the last couple of weeks and passed, good luck. Uh, congratulations on that. If you have a driver's test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. And remember the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.